Hi everyone, my name is Doug Berquist and I'm a QuickSight Solutions Architect Manager. And today I'm here to talk to you about getting to insights faster with AWS Glue, Databrew, and Amazon QuickSight. The agenda today is we're going to start off by looking at no-code, low-code analytics. And what is that? We're going to talk about Glue, Databrew, QuickSight, QuickSight Q, and then we'll go through a short demo of all three. Let's start off with what is no-code, low-code analytics. It's the ability to create repeatable data transformations, analysis, and machine learning insights at scale without the need for deep technical capability like SQL or Python. The rise of no-code, low-code analytics came from the need to demo democratize analytics throughout an organization. Let's take a quick look at what an architecture could look like. So you'll see we have various data sources on the left. And the first stop is Glue Databrew, where you can select data, uh, build your repeatable uh, ETL transformations called recipes. You can join data, uh, various data sets. Uh, you can also run data profiles uh, within Databrew so you can understand what type of changes you need to make uh, and run data quality jobs as well. And then you're able to output that data in various forms uh, like Athena, Redshift, or even just S3. And then lastly today, we'll look at QuickSight and Q on top of that data set so you can see how to visualize it once it's been cleansed and transformed. So first, let's talk about AWS Glue Databrew. Databrew is a serverless, no-code, visual data preparation platform. It allows business users, analysts, and data scientists to visually explore and experiment with data independently without writing any code. So it solves a few challenges. First, uh, the manual work challenge. Historically, you had to write the code to transform the data. Nuanced scripts are typically difficult to operationalize in a repeatable manner. It's also time consuming. Writing these blocks of code uh, take time and a lot of testing. It's also inefficient. Uh, generally, it's going to be a small group of programmers that can get overburdened. And they may not even necessarily understand or have intimate knowledge of all the data that they're working with since they're working for the business owners. So there's a need for a data preparation service that is easy to use and accessible to someone with the skill level of a non-technical data analyst. Glue Data Brew is a visual data preparation service that addresses this requirement. Let's take a look at some of the functionality. Uh, there's over 300 built-in transformations. Uh, you can do a lot of complex transformations of that data within a single recipe. It's for users of all technical levels. It is no code, low code. Uh, so it's mostly point and click. You can do advanced data profiling on the data so you can understand uh, where cleanliness may be an issue or what type of transformations you need to do. It also integrates with other existing data pipelines through the SDK or API. It's serverless, so it's usage at scale. Uh, you don't need to worry about standing up machines to accomplish your ETL jobs. And it can handle a lot of advanced use cases, uh, specifically for data preparation for maybe machine learning or complex analytics. Next, let's talk about Amazon QuickSight. QuickSight is the first cloud-native, serverless, embeddable, low-code, machine learning-powered BI service. That's a mouthful, what does it all mean? It means you can build machine learning powered dashboards and embed them anywhere without ever having to stand up a server. There's quite a few benefits. Um, first, you can augment your insights on demand using machine learning uh, as well as natural language. It's auto scaling and servers. Like I mentioned, you don't need to worry about standing up hardware. It's deeply integrated with other AWS services, so you can bring in uh, data from various places. Uh, you even can integrate with existing SageMaker models. It's uh, embeddable for internal or external users. Uh, let's say you are an ISV and you want to embed analytics within your application. You can do that using QuickSight very easily. And it's low cost. There's a very small barrier to entry because it's just pay-as-you-go pricing like you've come to expect from AWS. With QuickSight, you can create interactive dashboards and visuals that you can embed anywhere, internally or externally. You can add rich interactive filters, drill downs with no code. You can access it from any device. 
And you can also automate the data refresh or live query many of, many of the most popular databases. There's quite a bit of machine learning built throughout the platform. There's anomaly detection, uh, forecasting, you can bring your own model from SageMaker. There's auto-generated natural language narratives. And then there's also a uh, no-code machine learning model built into the platform. Next, let's talk about Amazon QuickSight Q. Q is a natural language querying capability that will allow the end users to ask ad hoc questions of the data. The key customer problem Q solves is what if the dashboard doesn't answer your question? If you're not an owner of that dashboard or you may not necessarily understand the underlying data source, you're able to ask a natural language query of Q and get your answers. Q will actually build a visualization for you. There's also machine learning built in so you can add forecasting directly to those charts so you can understand what will happen. So let's start with a quick demo of all three services and I'll show you how they work. So first, let me tell you a little bit about the data we're going to use. It's the New York City City Bike data set. It has information about all the rides that have happened within New York City from different station to station, as well as the different type of bicycles, whether they were classic or electric, uh, as well as if it was a casual rider or a membership holder. So it has some cool data where it has the Latin long of the start and finish and information about the route. It also has some structure changes that happened along the way. They updated what they were capturing in the data set. So it's a good candidate to use within DataBrew to account for those structure changes so that we have a nice, clean, unit data set ready to use within QuickSight. So our first stop is Glue DataBrew. I read a data profile on one of the data sets I'm going to use to build the recipe. You can see it gives you some high level statistics about the data, missing values, and then you can actually get into each individual column in that data set and understand a bit more about it. Whether it's distinct, uh, you can see the distribution, as well as if there's missing or invalid data. Next, we're going to take a look at a project in Databrew. Now, a project is a combination of two things, the data set and the recipe used to transform that data set. You'll see in the center of the screen here is actually a preview of what happens uh, to the data using that recipe. It samples the data for that preview and you can change some of the sampling uh, depending on your needs. And on the right hand side you'll actually see the steps for the recipe. The first step I did was to union two separate data sets. Now I mentioned before that there was a change in the structure of data along the way with what they captured. So I map fields together and union that data. And you can see the lineage here. Next, what I did is build a recipe to transform that data. There's a few different things I did of changing formats of fields. I created a few indicator columns. Uh, you can see here I created a, a date difference to understand the length of time a ride was going on. Uh, I also built a couple columns uh, using case statements, uh, similar to if you were going to write SQL. So you can see here it's a drag and drop. You pick the conditions that you want to build uh, for the case statements. I actually did some cleanup of the values. Uh, you'll see here I use some logic to do so. And then lastly, for those of you who know how to write SQL, uh, we'll actually show you the case statement at the bottom of this particular step. You can see that there. And when you're ready and you've built the transformations you need, uh, you simply just need to go up and publish the recipe. And when you publish a recipe, it actually creates different versions, so you can roll back recipes as needed. And when you're actually published, you can then go schedule a job. A job is a combination of a data set and a recipe. And there's some information here you'll see on where the data outputs, uh, as well as the type of output it does. So you can choose from replace or append. Um, I output this to S3, and you can see all of the files that are created here. I selected CSV, but it certainly could be JSON or Parquet. And then once that data was ready in S3, I brought into a SPICE data set within QuickSight. And you can see it's about 110 million records. Next, what I'll show you is 
how to build a dashboard using that data. Uh, so first we're going to start with an analysis. I already have one built, uh, but I will build a visualization here to show you how that process works. So I'll scroll down to the bottom of my analysis here. I'll add a visual and I can select what type of visual I want to use as well as start adding the fields that I want to use. So I'm actually going to average the length of time a trip took and I'm going to use the full trip field which I actually created in Databrew. So it's the start and end point within a trip. I will add a filter to filter for the top 50 trips so I can see what's the most popular. And then I will just do some resizing and shaping of that visual so it fits with the theme of the dashboard here. And note that I'm actually using a freeform uh, type of setup so that I can overlay different visuals on top of each other. So I made this more infographic style dashboard. Next, I'm going to add an insight. An insight is a narrative style visualization that has a few different options. I'll choose the anomaly detection today. So once I have that on my dashboard, I'm going to add a few fields which will be used for that anomaly detection. Once I'm ready, I can hit get started. And I can change the parameters of what's going to be used for that anomaly detection. The combination, I can actually change the name that will be used in that narrative so I can reference that and build a different type of natural language. I can change the severity, basically how sensitive uh, the algorithm is going to be. I can focus on a specific direction. I'm only really worried about higher than expected ride durations here. And I can also pick the fields which I want to analyze to be my contributors to that anomaly. And I'll do that here. When I'm ready, I'll take a look at that preview, but then go all the way up and hit save and run the full analysis. It'll take a few minutes to run. And once that's ready, I'll go publish my dashboard out so I can see what it looks like. So you'll see here at the bottom of the dashboard, there's quite a few anomalies that it found, and they're sorted by the most recent. However, I can click this Explore Anomalies button to get deeper into that data and ask further questions. So first I'm going to show the anomalies by date, and I can see the number of anomalies by day. I can select a specific date and scroll down and take a look at the actual anomalies and the breakout of the field I use for that anomaly detection. This happens to be destination. I can select the fields I want to use to run the contributor analysis. And you can see here, the ride for Pier 40 increased by 51% between May 29th and May 30th. So that might be an interesting insight I want to understand a bit further. So I can go to the top of my dashboard and I can filter for those dates and the actual station that I was curious about. So I'll go to end station here and I'll put in Pier 40. And the entire dashboard is going to update here. So with the narrative I have on top, you can understand some high level KPIs. If I scroll down here, you'll see a map of the actual destination. We'll come back to that in a second. I also have a sand key diagram to see all of the start positions or start stations and how they ended up at Pier 40. So that might be a little interesting later on. But what I'm going to do is zoom into that individual data point. And on this map, I set up a URL navigation within QuickSight so that I can actually jump to Google and go look at the Google Street View of those coordinates of that data point. With a little dragging around, I can see somebody riding a city bike, and there's the actual station. So it's really powerful to have some data, but then also maybe link to another platform or application to get deeper answers. Next, let's talk about QuickSight Q. So I can start asking some questions of my data that maybe aren't addressed by the dashboard. I can ask simple questions like how many rides were taken. It will answer that at a high level. But I also can get deeper into the data. Next, I'm going to ask a more colloquial question, right? Like what route is the most popular? Popular is not really a term that's known. And I've already gone ahead and predefined most popular within Q. So Q actually knows that as a known term it will use to search for the number of rides as well as route. I've also given route as an alias to 
the full trip. Next, let's ask which trip is the longest. So when setting up the data within Q, I dictated that duration is a length of time. So the term longest is actually known within QuickSight and it can build a visual here. If I know that that visual is correct, I can mark that as reviewed so that Q is more sure about answering that question next time. Next, I'm going to ask a question using the actual values of the data, not just the column headers. So I asked which round trip route is the most popular. Now round trip is a value within the round trip indicator. So you can see here, Q actually filtered the data for the number of rides and then broke it out by the full trip uh, field, which I've also, again, aliased as route. Next, I'm going to ask a question about a specific destination, again, about a value within a column. You can see here, I'm asking about Pershing Square. However, the data that comes up is 111 million. I know that that's the full data set, so there might be some sort of addition I can add. You can see here, I can highlight and define a term if I need to, but in this case, because it's a specific value, I'm not going to define it. I'm going to try my question again and maybe try a different value. And it turns out the location is actually Pershing Square North. You can see the data here. Next, I'm going to add another qualifier or filter. And I can say when it was a round trip. Q will parse those fields and again, filter that data a bit further for me. The power of this is that a user may not necessarily know what field their value is in, but they know the value that they want to filter for. You can let Q figure that out for you. I'm going to ask one more question here. What is the most popular place to start when going to Pershing Square North? It's a fairly complicated question. And what Q is going to do is parse out that question. It will recognize individual values like Pershing Square North and popular, which is a known term uh, so that it will count the number of rides because we've dictated that popular means number of rides. And you can see here the data set. Again, I can mark that as reviewed so that I know it's correct for next time. Now there's two more capabilities I would like to show. First, let's ask a question. What trip is the most popular? We know that's right, so we'll review, mark it as reviewed. But next, what we can do is add question variants. Right, questions that have the same answer. For example, which route is the most popular? Which route gets the most rides? And I can return that answer. And again, we're helping Q out answer questions correctly for future users. Next, we're gonna take a look at total rides by month. Now that's actually a visual that's already on the dashboard. So what I can do is first, I'll actually add a forecast. So you can see the machine learning capability in Q. But next, I'm actually going to link to a specific visual on the dashboard. So when I select that, I can scroll down and pick the visual I would like. You can see the preview there, and I can link to visual. So that way, that question is always tied to a specific data set on the dashboard so that the users are always looking at what the admins have dictated to be correct. So that's it with the demo for now. There's certainly a lot more capability that could be shown with each one of those services. Uh, so certainly contact your SA at AWS and we're happy to talk about that. The last thing I wanna leave you with is a couple of resources. So first, there's resources for self-study. Uh, we have QuickSight Demo Central, so you can actually get your hands on QuickSight without having to sign up for an account. There is QuickSight and Q workshops, so you can actually have hands-on experience and learn those services. There's QuickSight Community, which has blogs, you can ask questions and get answers uh, from the community as well as the active solution architects on that community. And then of course, there's documentation and news about QuickSight. Here's a few more, um, just some links you may be curious in for introduction to Q and so on. And then lastly, uh, please scan so you can explore AWS Skill Builder uh, and the AWS certification site. Again, my name is Doug Berquist. I'm a solutions architect manager here at Amazon, specifically for QuickSight. And I appreciate you taking the time to spend with me today.